Hello, hello, and welcome again to a Beatles program that we call Things We Said Today. This is a weekly podcast in which we talk about anything that has to do with the Beatles, any part of their history, and also things that are going on today. I'm one of the co-hosts of the show. I'm Ken Michael. Some of you know me for my other Beatles program called Every Little Thing. And I'm being joined by some of my regular co-hosts, because one of them is actually absent on the show for this time out. But first of all, we'll welcome Steve Marinucci, who of course writes for Beatles Examiner. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Uh, hello, everyone. And also one of the writers for Beatle Fan Magazine, that being Al Sussman. Hi, Al. Hi, Ken. Hello there, everybody. And unfortunately, Alan Cozen, also uh, one of the writers for Beatle Fan, couldn't make it for the show this evening. But we're pleased to bring back once again from New York's WFUV, Darren DeVivo. Hi, Darren. How you doing, everyone? You guys keep trying to get rid of me, and I keep coming back. <laughs> well, you're, you're such a, a great addition to the show And, uh, you know, you're going to be a, a regular uh, At least uh, I think uh, you will be As well as uh, we're, we're going to try and rotate, if we can Between you and Tom Franjone When either one of you are available Plus getting other guests as well But uh, it's great to have you back on the show again, Darren Thank and, you The thought um, of me and Tom uh, rotating is a little scary but it is, uh, it's, it's my pleasure to be here. Well, I'm, I'm sorry to plant that thought in your head there, Darren. But um, <laughs> on the show this time, I thought we would uh, bring up two topics. And uh, since it is very timely, we are recording this a couple of days after the Grammy Awards show. Of course, a lot of things happened at the Grammy Awards. Paul McCartney performed with Rihanna and Kanye West. The song Four or Five Seconds, which is uh, the new single, and it's actually doing quite well on the Billboard charts. For those of you curious, it has uh, it's jumped all the way to number 15 after two weeks and probably will will know more in the next day or so. But um, they perform that song together. We'll also talk about how George's Lifetime Achievement Award was handled at the Grammys and just get everyone's impression of what they thought of the broadcast. Uh, first of all, why don't we just talk about the actual performance of Paul with Kanye West and Rihanna and find out from each of you what you thought of that. Let's start with um, Darren. I was very underwhelmed. I'm still not exactly sure what I think of this whole collaboration or collaborations with the first song with Kanye West and now this song. And forgive me if I refer to her as Rhiannon. I can't get the Fleetwood Mac song out of my head. <laughs> and 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 uh, we're playing on WFUV, Rhiannon Giddens from the Carolina Chocolate Drops and the new Basement Tapes. And she just put a solo album out. So it's Rihanna. My wife has told me a million times it's Rihanna. I don't know what to make out of the collaboration, number one. Uh, I don't exactly know what Paul's role was. I don't know exactly why he's involved in this but the performance was underwhelming i mean i seemed to me his microphone wasn't on while he was mm -hmm. singing either that or the mix was very very low or or awful and you couldn't hear him perhaps that was his request i don't know strumming an acoustic guitar on the side you know it was kind of a odd an odd thing to have Paul playing more of a backup role yet getting billed as an equal and being that we couldn't hear him sing. I don't really know. It's almost like you give him an incomplete. It was nice to see him there. Nice to see him sitting in the front row. One of the highlights of the whole broadcast for me was watching him, uh, dance around the orchestra and be told to sit down by a cameraman. That was a little more exciting than, <laughs> than the performance. But, um, <laughs> I guess it was great to have him there, but, Ultimately, it was very underwhelming. Hmm. Yeah, I, I think uh, most fans, it's, I read a lot of what the fans are saying, especially on Facebook. Nobody seems to know why the situation was that you couldn't hear Paul, why his microphone was either turned off or, or as you say, was low in the mix. I couldn't hear his vocals at all. But uh, that was a, a part of, of that performance that was kind of disappointing for me. But um, I actually really thought that that song worked really well as a live song. In fact, I think um, I kind of called, called it electrifying because I think it's, it was better than the studio recording of the song. I think uh, the crowd seemed to be into it. It's a lot of fun to watch Paul playing along with it. 
But uh, like you said, Darren, it's not that often that you get to see Paul take a backseat to other people. And um, if you do look up the song four or five seconds, you will find that the three of them are listed as songwriters. So he did have a hand in some way with the songwriting. But um, what about you, Al? What do you think of that performance? Well, let me ask. Let me ask you guys. Um, did you see the video? You know the 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 vid- the the music video in advance of the Grammy performance. I think I, I think I did. Okay, um, I, didn't, Either, I, didn't, uh, I didn't pay a whole lot of attention to it though. Oh, okay. Because because actually the you know kind of the format of how the the performance went down in the video was actually very similar to the way the performance went down on stage. You know, Paul was very obviously very intentionally, you know, in the background, basically just strumming along. Now, again, I don't know whether it was by design or accident that uh, that you couldn't hear his backing vocal or, or what. But uh, it was, um, you know, the the difference is, and you know, I mentioned this last uh, last time, was that you know Rihanna is, you know, it may not be what her music may not be to our particular taste, but at least she does have, you know, does have discernible talent. So that's probably why the the live performance seemed to work better than uh, than certainly than. Uh, <clears throat> than Kanye's live performance uh, of, you know, his collaboration with Paul, um, right. you know, as, as auto tuned as it was, you know, heavily auto tuned, but it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's hard to tell. Uh, I, I have a feeling they, you know, that they were trying to kind of recreate the format of the, of the video. I have a question because mm. I mm-hmm. will admit that I will admit, first of all, that I, I'm very much old school. I'm a physical format guy, and Mm -hmm. I find it hard to get excited when somebody says a new single has been released, when in essence it's only available digitally. My tendency Mm -hmm. is when when I hear it's available on a disc, then I'll pay attention. So I'm guilty of that. So when the Kanye West song came out in, was it December? Or or right, at, right after Janu- the holidays, January. The, yeah, right. It yeah. was right after the, the holidays. Day. I I didn't really pay very close attention to it. So the song that Kanye West performed at the Grammys, that's the song, correct? The first yes, right. Mm-hmm. And Paul yeah. was not involved. Paul was not involved in the live broadcast, the performance right, of the cause... song on the Grammys. It was right. The right. second mm-hmm. one was so, okay. So, okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I just wanted to make sure I had that straight. I don't think yeah. I saw the Rihanna video. I saw the behind the scenes video. Oh, the making of, yes. The making of. And I thought I was yeah. watching the video. And so I got very confused and mm. took a nap. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How did you feel, Steve? I was really underwhelmed. And I, th- I think, and I, I said this on Facebook, I think, that if Paul had been had added even a little bit of a vocal it would have been so much better but he really looked uh, i think i uh, you know what al what you said about whether or not they cut his guitar uh, cut his guitar i mean his mic off or what that's a very strange question by the way the song is number two on the hot r&b songs and the hot r&b hip-hop songs chart at this moment I'm mm. sitting, that, that, sitting here looking at that them. figures. Yeah, and the and the funny thing, and I think we I think we mentioned this last week is the song has nine songwriters. Yeah, nine songwriters. Yeah, I know. That's ah, but the but, way of the world in that uh, in that uh, that uh, musical genre. Right, but as far as the as far as the performance goes, I I was rather I was really disappointed. It, it was hard to tell whether Paul didn't look completely. I mean, he was trying to, you know, to to do what he what he was supposed to, but he really I, he seemed a little he seemed a little lost. I mean, I like the song. I've I've said you know I've said before. I think I said last week that I thought the song was better than than uh, the Kanye collaboration, but the live version on the Grammys just really 
kind of just kind of fell flat as far as I was concerned. But uh, Pat, in what way did it fall flat? I mean, Rihanna sang her heart out. You know, I'm mm -hmm. sure if you're not really into Kanye West's style of of singing, if you call it singing, there's that mm -hmm. element to it. And then you get to watch Paul play guitar to everybody. It is disappointing when you see him right up to the microphone and you can't hear him. And I'm wondering, right. really, you know, was that plan that way? We don't know. You know, yeah, there no, may have been something no, decided before the show. We don't even know. But right, we don't. Hmm. You're right. We don't know. It it looked for. Uh, I mean, he was close enough to the mic that although he did not vocalize into the mic very much or put his lips up to the mic to where it sounded, it looked like he was trying to sing. But there was enough interaction there. I mean, he was trying to sing the lyrics as he was strumming. And and for a guy like that to be strumming away and not being able to contribute any lyrics, that was just weird. That was just, you know, any singing. That was just weird. Uh, I, although, I, although it's, as I said, in the video, it's basically the same thing. You know, he really is, is, is very much just a background uh, figure. Right. But, I, but see, the thing is that, you know, in a situation like that where... I mean, everything, look at all the buzz that came off of that show for whatever reason, you know, of everything that happened. I mean, there were so many things well, that happened. I'm, I'm not talking about Kanye. Specific. Oh, okay. I'm talking about everything. I mean, there yeah. were, there were some, there were some, some very interesting, I mean, there were some great moments. I mean, the Jeff Lynn moment, I, I have, I, in the article I wrote, I mentioned the Melanie Lambert uh, Little Red Wagon, I thought that was amazing. I thought that was fantastic. Mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe nobody else does, but I thought oh, that was uh, great. Miranda, Miranda Lambert. Miranda Lambert, excuse yeah. me. Um, uh, yeah, no, I thought that was that was that mm -hmm. was a great song. Mm -hmm. And there were a couple of others, um, you know. And I I I went down my my list of of Grammy thoughts. Uh, you know, uh, I put it on my Vintage Rock and Roll Examiner site. Um, but you know, I really thought that. Had Paul active done even just a little bit of vocalizing, it would have made this special. I just really thought the whole thing was underwhelming. I really, I think if Paul had been allowed to contribute in some way or to even just add a little line of a vocal, it would have, it would have created. Uh, there would have been a great reaction from the McCartney fans and everybody because you know that's what they they like him to do. And I think if he had been able to do that, I think that the song would have been that much better. I mean, no matter that he doesn't do that in the video and on the recording, you know, they could have done that for this and I, because this is a special moment. Well, you know, well, except that, awesome. you know, basically they're not, you know, they're not programming the show for McCartney fans, they're they're programming yeah. it for the, you know, the young desired demographic, you know. Well, and so, they, mm. that, so they really don't care uh, whether they, uh, you know, whether whether Paul is a, is is given a line or so uh, to well, vocalize. You know, they, it's it's more important that they have uh, that they're concentrating on on Rihanna and, and Kanye because they, you know. They're the ones that bring the, the, you know, the, the young eyeballs to the screen. That's true. Mm. But they also know damn well that anything and everything on that show, especially now, gets buzzed in social media. And had Paul contributed even a couple of seconds, it would have really put a polish on that. It would have made that a little more special it, it wouldn't know. have made any difference at all it would have you know it would have, it, the only people that it would have made a difference to are you know really the hardcore mccartney lovers whatever you know if you want to put it that way you know That's, I, I, it, I, that that is true but i think that and and, and granted in seeing some of the the opinions from the McCartney fans over the last couple of days, especially after what he pulled at the end of the show, you know, it, it, it might've eased it up a little bit, but I, it, um, it, wouldn't, it really wouldn't have made any difference. And, and as far as the reaction of the, of the fans to, you know, I, I've, I've gotten emails from a couple of friends about, you know, how could he lower himself 
to either mm. to work with this uh, with this scum and and all this nonsense. And I mean, it's <laughs> Paul McCartney had no control over the fact that that Kanye West is a jerk. You know, mm-hmm. in it just just as much as as a Beatle, he had no control over you know over some of John's less admirable qualities. You know, right, and I've, I've I've seen the compare. There have been some comparisons between the two. I'm not sure I agree with them. But... Oh yeah, well, I mean that's 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 ridiculous. Any any kind of comparisons, but it's you know it's it, it, he's not lowering himself to work with these people. You know, he's working with them because he has a history of admiring, particularly black music performers. Right. You know, but going I'm... back to, you know, when they were over here in 64 and they were talking about how much they liked Chuck Jackson and, you know, early Motown and all. And I mean, they, you know, the Paul and Linda loved reggae. They revere Stevie Wonder. You know, uh, Paul worked with uh, with Michael Jackson before he became Wacko Jacko. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, he's had a long history of being an admirer of black music. And, it, you know, it happens that they, you know, let's face it, Rihanna, like them or not, Rihanna and Kanye West are major figures in the, in the pop world today. And, you know, Paul has no control over the fact that Kanye West acts like a jerk. Right. And so, and somebody I had not noticed how many Grammy nominations or Grammys he's gotten until mm-hmm. somebody mentioned it on Monday and I was my mouth actually dropped. I well, as a matter of fact, today as we're recording this is the 11th anniversary of the release of his first album. So he it's not like he's, you know, uh, you know, some new artist. He's been around now a while. Right. Yeah, but the you know the thing is things are you know to compare the Grammy total that he has versus say the Beatles or Paul McCartney has. Well, you know the the yeah. world, but the world is completely different now. Yeah, it's you're things talking explode. about two oh, definitely things things yeah. explode a lot much uh, much more now oh, than they did back in '64. Sure. But I, I'm but still you know, saying you... I'm still saying that McCartney would have been a nice to even just briefly would have been a nice touch to that song. Um, I was just going to say, uh, based on what Al was saying before, yes, Paul doesn't have control over Kanye's actions or anything like that, but he had, had control from the very beginning of being involved with Kanye West and with Rihanna and, and deciding whether to make a record with them. And he evidently chose to take a back seat on the recordings mm-hmm. and also on the live performance. I mean, yes, yeah. it, it's kind of when you see him go up to the microphone and you're expecting to hear him and you don't, you got to question why that's happening. But mm-hmm. still, I mean, it, it's, his, it's his decision whether to work with these people in the first place. So he has control in that regard. So, um, you know, but it is kind of unusual. If you follow the entire history of all the Beatles, there's, there's plenty of times when they've been involved with other artists' recordings as a producer or as a writer, and you may not mm-hmm. hear them on the records. But, right. and, you know, the, the thing that's unusual about this in the case of four or five seconds or only one, the two songs, if you weren't told Paul McCartney was on the records, you wouldn't know it. You mm-hmm. know, it's only in name and, and because it's being said publicly that we know that Paul's on it. So here it is. We're visually actually seeing Paul with these two other performers, and you don't hear him. And that's, that's a disappointment to me. It's not a disappointment that he's working with these people, and I happen to like both those songs a lot. But the whole mm-hmm. idea of not hearing his voice... I, I just wish I knew why that really happened. That that couldn't have been if he's up there mouthing the words to the to the song. He evidently is trying to sing and and hopefully be heard. So mm-hmm. that's the only disappointing part of the whole thing for me. It's not the songs and it's not who he's working with. It's just that for that particular moment, you would have hoped you could have heard him sing background vocals, right? With the others. Right. So I, I, that's all. No, I was going to say uh, what Steve had alluded to, if. It may not have changed the overall feel of the broadcast or what the general public thought of it, but I think the McCartney fans, the Beatle fans, it would have validated the whole thing a little more if we were able to hear Paul sing. There'd be less of a debate about the purpose, the intention, the value of the whole collaboration to begin with. And then, uh, you know, 
Of course, even if we heard Paul sing, Kanye's actions after the broadcast would taint everybody's opinion about the whole project. Uh, mm. One of the things that, uh, well, one of you mentioned, Paul's never hesitated to collaborate with other artists. So the fact that he's collaborating with uh, with Kanye West and uh, Rihanna didn't surprise me or I didn't at any moment think it was odd when I heard the rumors that they were working together. Uh, mm-hmm. Paul, a couple of years ago, collaborated with Foo Fighters uh, or or Dave Grohl specifically, um, not the band Foo Fighters, but, you know, the reunited members of Nirvana. Of course, uh, Al mentioned the Michael Jackson and Stevie Wonder mix in Carl Perkins around that same time, et cetera, et cetera. The other observation I want to make about the collaboration is it tends to be the nature of the genre. If you look at a lot of the songs, which are hits, they're not usually by one artist. It's always a confusing mm. uh, a credit. It's so-and-so featuring so-and-so with so-and-so assisted by yeah. it's they usually are like that. And when you listen to the song, you might hear somebody uh, vocalize briefly. He got a credit as if he were an equal on the song. I think that's what we're looking at here. McCartney strummed a few chords. He got credited, you know, um, you know, he got a credit to the on the song as if he were an equal almost. So the fact that his uh, performance seems minimal on the recorded version and in the performance actually, if I hope I'm making sense, mirrors how a lot of these songs tend to be presented to the public anyway. Exactly. You know? Did that make sense? Do you know what I'm saying? No, it absolutely makes sense. <clears throat> and, and in fact, on the, you know, uh, again, on the video, uh, his contribution vocally is is hardly even audible on the video right or on the or on the you know on the track so again you know his uh, uh in the live performance he you know he may have been simply potted way you know his vocal mic may have been just potted way down because that's the way it is on the record mm-hmm. right you know i I'm, I'm beginning to wonder if maybe this whole thing was just a was an experiment by the three of them to see what the reaction would be on all sides. Um, no, I, I think it's just, you know, the, I, I, you know, cause I don't know, since we don't know who approached who, we don't know whether, whether it was Paul who approached them about working together or whether it was Kanye who approached Paul. We don't, you know, we don't know any of this. Mm-hmm. And, uh, uh, you know, so we probably, if we did know, we would probably then have a better idea of the you know the the musical the musical structure right know. but uh but I clearly he you know clearly he's he's there just on at least certainly on the two the two the two tracks that have been issued he's there consciously as just you know just a side man i think mm-hmm. al al brings out a good point in saying it was a calculated experiment i also felt all along i wondered if the whole post-show uh, incident, which didn't involve Paul, Kanye's comments about Beck winning, if that wasn't yeah. calculated on Kanye's part for the publicity well, uh, that it brought every, up. I'd you say know, every, here, he does is yeah. calculate. <laughs> yeah. I think the other thing that works against this performance is that there were two or three or four other eye-opening performances which dwarfed uh, McCartney being mm-hmm. on stage strumming an acoustic guitar. Exactly. Mm-hmm. That was, yeah. Yeah. Annie Lennox. Yeah, that, yeah, that was def- definitely dynamite hearing her sing. Mm-hmm. Right. And I loved, I loved hearing uh, Beck with um, Chris Martin of Coldplay. Mm-hmm. That they were was very really good. nice. And uh, a big course. highlight for me, Usher doing the Stevie Wonder song, If It's Magic, yeah. and mm-hmm. Stevie coming on at the end playing harmonica. That was mm-hmm. sweet. That was mm-hmm. great with a, with a harp player on the song, just like on the recording. Just it was a, that was an amazing performance there. Yeah, it was. That was that was another one. That was one of the ones I mentioned. And so. I put in my vote for ACDC opening the show up was just out of this world. <laughs> <laughs> Loved it. Loved it. I do want to bring up the whole uh, George. Uh, getting the Lifetime Achievement Award. Oh yeah. Um, I, I must. I, I must admit to you guys that for so many years that I've watched the Grammy Awards, anytime there is that kind of an award where it was presented the day before, 
you just get usually a photo on screen or maybe a video for a few seconds and that's it. So the way this was handled didn't surprise me in the least, but I mm -hmm. was still disappointed. Uh, the fact that yeah. you had Paul McCartney in the audience and you also had someone else like Jeff Lynne who's worked closely with George, it would have been nice if one of, one or the other or both had said something about George. But again, I'm sure they're not in control of those things. But um, Smokey Robinson and Nile Rodgers said a few words about George getting the award. I do like the fact that Smokey was there because of the fact that George wrote two songs for Smokey mm -hmm, in his sure. solo career. So uh, not many people are aware of that. But, you know, it's nice that he said a few words about George. But still, the fact that it was really kind of glossied over, like all the Lifetime Achievement Awards really are. They're just mentioned very quickly. It's a very big yeah. disappointment, considering the mm -hmm. fact that, that Paul was there and Jeff Lynne. There used to be a separate segment on the show for the Lifetime Achievement Awards. And I remember there was one year when, and this is quite a while ago because he's been gone for a number of years, but uh, this is in the, in the mid nineties, I think. And they climaxed the Lifetime Achievement Awards by awarding one to Frank Sinatra and had him come out and he started, you know, this is very late in his life and he started rambling mm -hmm. and they in fact, cut them off mm -hmm. they, went, they went to commercial and it seemed like ever ever since then they've taken the lifetime achievement awards and just simply kind of you know parceled them out to to the you know the other award presentations it's just like a little add-on you know even when barry gibb came out and mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. the Bee Gees had gotten, uh, you know, uh, one of those one of those awards, and so they, you know, they kind of, you know, kind of condescendingly mentioned that the Bee Gees had received the award, and, and I mean, it took Barry to even mention his brothers, you know, mm -hmm. otherwise they would have gone totally unmentioned, right? And mm. and then it was like on to the next award. So it's it's um, yeah it's sad, but as Ken said, it's not surprising because that's the way the show is. You know, again, it's aimed at younger people than you know than than us, and, uh, and they've been gearing over the past few years, past maybe five years or so, a broadcast that's music centric and yes. uh, less awards, less talking, which kind of oh, fits yeah. mm. with today's. You know, everything is fast. Everything mm -hmm. is, you know, short attention span. A uh, mm -hmm. lot of talking, a lot of awards, a lot of honoring these old dead people. Who are these old people? That's not yeah. going to, uh, you know, that's not going to uh, drive up the ratings and make the advertisers happy. So, yeah. uh, so like Ken I said, Ken was right, hit the nail right on the head. They mentioned it and moved on. Yeah, I, I no watched surprise. the, uh, I watched the, the pre-show online. And there was a mm -hmm. lovely moment, a couple of lovely moments. One when um, Glenn Campbell won uh, mm -hmm. one of the country music awards and his wife came up and mentioned the fact that, you know, obviously he can't be there because he's now in the final stages of, of Alzheimer's. And it was a very poignant moment. And, and then also Johnny Winter uh, won one of the blues awards and Edgar. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and also Johnny, one of uh, one of the members of Johnny's band, accepted it, and it was again a very very poignant moment. And but it's you know something that you're you know that would you know never be part of the the CBS telecast now because you know they have to make room for twenty what was it? I think there were like twenty three separate performances on the three hour show. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's basically it's, all it is, is, you know, the, just the, the performances and the major awards. And that's that's the way it is now. I was just going to say quickly, I remember the day when we were young. I'm going to break into song now. No, rem <laughs> remember when remember when we were young and like classical music would get like a half an hour block of the yes. of the broadcast. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, was, now was forget a it. Lifetime ago. Nothing for classical, nothing for jazz. That's all done in the pre-show. Right. I mean, the pre-show is like four hours long itself. <laughs> right. I, I got to admit something here. Uh, in, in the last several years when the Grammys have come on, 
I rarely watch it from start to finish. I go in and out. You know, I watch it for a mm-hmm. while, then I go to my computer or something because it doesn't really hold my interest. So I haven't been able to really analyze the Grammys, but this was one time when I watched it from start to finish. And I never really felt the way that Darren described it until now, that it's it's more of a concert, it's more performances, there's less emphasis on the awards aspect of everything. Mm-hmm. I mean, there are times when uh, in the middle of the show, they had Imagine Dragons on. And it was mm-hmm. just a live performance from Las Vegas. And I'm saying, what does this have to do with the Grammy Awards? Yeah. And so that there wasn't are a commercial? I, I thought, no, that was the full song. That they I thought performed. that was a commercial. That's what I thought when <laughs> I first. Pretty... And then I thought, wait a minute, this is, they're, they're playing the whole song. You know, I thought maybe yeah. they bought time or something. And maybe was, maybe they did. The target, the target logo was or something was in the corner. Yes. And I kept, yeah. I checked my remote. I thought I sat on the remote control and changed the channel by accident. <laughs> <laughs> no, but there's, there's so much that takes place in that show that has nothing really to do with the award show. And granted, I will take any excuse to see Paul McCartney live on television. But to mm-hmm. be realistic about it, they're doing a song that just was released only a few weeks ago. I mean, mm-hmm. it's not up for a Grammy. It right. wouldn't even, it's not even qualified to be up for a Grammy because it's too new. And yet yeah. they're performing it. So what does that have to do with the actual awards that are being presented? So there's so much of that going on now. It's becoming more of a promotional tool for these artists and mm-hmm. less about the awards itself. And I mm-hmm. just wanted to say about the Lifetime Achievement Award, and thankfully a lot of this is online now, but Danny Harrison did speak for George at the awards right. show and he had some very nice mm-hmm. things to say and unless you go online and you you hunt it down you're not going to get to see this something yeah. like that i don't even see why they can't put a few seconds of the actual lifetime achievement presentations what was recorded and put that into the show mm-hmm. not expecting a you know a five minute speech but you know 30 seconds for each person i mean they, they deserve that much if they can if they can do their in memoriam segment <laughs> You know, which yeah. goes on for a few minutes. Why can't they do that for the artists who get the Lifetime Achievement Award? Mm-hmm. Either that, or they could have even, since he was in the front row, they could have arranged uh-huh. it so that so that Paul would be one of the presenters for that next award, and so then he would be there to announce the fact that George had. had been given the lifetime achievement award so at least that would be you know there would be a little bit more of a connection than uh than the way it was handled yeah no that's a great point al Uh, yeah well anyway so um very quickly before we uh have the uh the talk about the beatles in which we're going to actually discuss what we (laughs) we think is their best year since there was just in the news in the last week or so the news that lady gaga is working with paul mccartney Mm-hmm. On a secret project, oh, what God. do we all think about that? I'm going to throw up. <laughs> seriously, Steve. I, I seriously, I do not like. I do not like Lady Gaga. I I think she's a she's a combination of Madonna and and um, Miley Cyrus. In other words, it, I mean, it's just it, you know she's evolving. She does the David Bowie thing where she evolves continually, but she doesn't have the talent. She really doesn't. Um, at least to my I mean, I hear I have the Tony Bennett album. I'm a, I think I've I've mentioned. If I haven't, I I will say I will confess that I am a Tony Bennett fan. Um, sure. But I do not like this album. I t- Tony's solo songs are okay. Her she does a couple of solo songs that are horrible, and the two of them together just don't make it. And the way she was fawning all over him at the Grammys and trying to live up to the cheek to cheek title was just yeah. really, really, really sad. And mm. it's just uh, this whole project. Uh, and uh, it just has, you know, just kind of this hype tone to it. And I really hope whatever she's doing with McCartney uh, will be different, but I, I'm afraid I'm guessing it won't be. Yeah. She's legitimately talented. But she doesn't really know kind of the, especially that that style of music, you know, the the pop mm-hmm. standards, the Great American Songbook, whatever, however you want to call it. She doesn't really know the subtleties 
of doing those songs. You know, right. she everything is so over the top with her. And right. you know, plus the fact that, like you say, she is very much a, you know, her whole thing is very much out of the 80s Madonna, uh, you know, playbook. Uh, mm -hmm. Playbook that Madonna herself needs to get rid of because oh my uh, God. she oh. looked, uh, that was that was pretty ludicrous. I mean, you know, yes, uh, hey, guess what? You know, look at look at your birth certificate. You're not uh, you're not 20 years old anymore. <laughs> You know, mm -hmm. but I, as far as uh, the the project with Paul, uh, I mean, who knows? It's uh, you know, I don't know. It seems to be very hush hush as to what kind of a project it is. So, who you know, who knows? But uh, you know, hopefully, it won't be too embarrassing. But it, but again, you know, it's uh, uh, is another example of of Paul being willing to work with contemporary artists so mm -hmm. we'll uh we'll have to see and we'll also have to see what uh what else comes out of the uh the whole kanye west collaboration as well yeah that, i mean that's been a big point that you know that i've been thinking about the kanye west thing you know if they go somewhere else where they you know where they go obviously I said that after the first song, and they and they you know hit up with uh, four or five seconds. Um, be uh, you know where they go from here if they go anywhere at all. Mm. You know that will be um, you know that will be something to watch. Um, I'm hoping I'm hoping that actually that it doesn't end with four or five seconds. I'd like to see something you know something else between them. But, I'd like to hear something where you actually feel Paul's presence on the record. Mm. You know, mm. because to me, I mean, I, I do like these two songs, but I just don't feel any of McCartney's imprint on, on the records at all. Mm -hmm. But uh, Lady Gaga, I really think she's a very good singer. I just have never cared for her songs. <laughs> I think she could right. sing well. And I think that uh, kind of like Madonna, she's relied way too much on her outfits, her crazy outfits to get attention. Mm -hmm. And if she, you know, Tony Bennett said to Lady Gaga that if he just concentrated on being yourself and being a singer, then you'll do fine. I, I think if if Tony Bennett chose to sing with her, he's got to see something in her. So the same thing with Paul working with Kanye West. So there's yeah. got to be something to these people anyway. This isn't the first time that Bennett has worked with a, a young woman like like that. He's wor he worked with Katie Lang, which actually, sure. which I did not did not like originally either but going back and listening to that album actually it's better it's much better than i originally gave it credit for because lang is a, is a halfway decent singer better than lady gaga so i think katie lang's a terrific vocalist uh mm -hmm. and i really i haven't purchased the lady gaga record yet so i'm not gonna uh reserve any comments but uh the katie lang album i thought was really Good and then of course there was uh, Tony Bennett was not uh, shy about heaping praise on Amy Winehouse. Mm -hmm. Also, yes. oh yeah, mm -hmm. yeah they that, they did that he did that uh, duets two album. That, that's right, yeah, the duet, right, right, right. Which actually, which Amy Winehouse's song with him was one of the best songs on that album. Where the duet with Lady Gaga was one of the worst. So, <laughs> at least in my opinion. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. I can't. I can't bring <laughs> myself to to say anything nice about her. I can't. So, Steve has a Lady Gaga poster right over his head right now. There we go. Right. He's not letting on to that. I'm not mm. letting on. Well, uh, let's move on and talk about this other topic. Uh, I thought we'd have some fun with, which is to pick what you think was the best year that the Beatles had as a group, and. Um, this could be a combination of anything that they did in a particular year. It could be just the events of the year. It could be more on the music. It could be both. Whatever you decide, I'd like to get everyone's take on what they think was their best year. Before we even talk about that, I must say that if you're looking at the years 1963 through 69, this is not, it, it's not that easy to give an answer here because I can make a case for just about every single year and tell you what was terrific about the Beatles in each year. So I'm very curious to find out uh, with each of you what you would pick as being their best year. So who should I start with first? 
Um, <laughs> Darren is raising his hand. So why don't we go with you, Darren? Yeah. <laughs> I really was raising my hand. That's very funny. <laughs> that is a, a good question. And I went back and forth with that. I think artistically and commercially speaking, 1967, I think mm -hmm. you can make the case for 1966 being arguably their most important year because it was the year of transition for them. So uh, I went back and forth in my head with this. I would think maybe uh, if you're bringing in the commercial uh, successes, I think you got to lean towards 1967 as uh, as being their their best year. Uh, most successful year, sales-wise, impact-wise, quality of work-wise. So I'm going to lean towards 67 and uh, say that 66, though, might have been arguably more important. Hmm. So it's just very interesting how you said about 1966 and a uh, year of transition. You don't look at every year from 63 on as being a period of transition, certainly through 67, because there was so much progress being made in the music, step by step, album by album. And you can certainly say in 65, you know, just going into Rubber Soul, that's a huge transition there itself. Oh, oh, so, oh absolutely. But look at 66, um, not just the music, but look at what the band did. A rather unprecedented move for a pop band to decide we are not touring anymore. They took themselves off the road. At that point, they began to also develop as individuals, with Paul composing The Family Way, John going off and doing the acting, uh, shooting the film How I Won the War. I would imagine during this period, uh, George did his, some heavy investigating into uh, Indian music, you know, religion, uh, and, and spent some time doing that. I think that they transitioned from being that band that recorded, toured, recorded, toured, made a movie, recorded, toured, to being a band that was about to blossom individually and together. Uh, it was a year in which, really, they made that conscious decision to be a studio band and... um which is what they weren't when 66 started, when R Rubber Soul was brand new and they were still touring. So I look at it like that, uh, that you did have maturation through each year, yes, and that continued in 66, but it was a major, I think that point when they stopped touring, the game changed for the band. Mm -hmm. You could make the argument, sure. if you want the two, that that could have been the very first stage or the first seeds planted for what would become the breakup. They were now able to spend time as a band, but also grow individually. Very well put there, Darren. Okay. Um, how about you, Steve? Well, I, I looked at this from a number of different viewpoints. Um, the first, I mean, the first thing that hit me when you mentioned doing this was, and I, and I even asked you if we could look at it, uh, you know, in a number of different, um, you know, aspects was culturally and without question, 64, you, you can't, there's nothing beating 64. They were everywhere. I'm, and I, and you know, you say that now and people compare it to the internet, but I mean, there was no internet in 64 and they were everywhere. They were all over the newspapers. They were, um, they were all over the, t the, in the television. I'm, I remember I delivered a, a newspaper in '64, and this was in Boston. And they, the uh, I believe it was I'm trying to remember the name of the paper, uh, um, but they ran a four-day series by each Beatle. Uh, it was one of these things, you know, obviously they didn't write it, but, but I mean, that's, that's the way things were. I mean, the Beatles were everywhere in 64. They were cause they were causing commotion. They were, you know, the hair that was freaking people out. It was, there were just so many things and, you know, and then I went over to the music and even then you really can't get past 64. They had 19 top 40 hits that year. Nineteen. That I mean, that's that's amazing. 
mm-hmm. you know, um, and you know, it, uh, it started, you know, obviously with, I want to hold your hand and, and it ended up with, uh, she's a woman and I feel fine. And that's quite a musical progression right there. It's not strawberry fields forever. It's not Abbey road, but it's the seeds of what was happening what was going to happen over the next four years that they were not going to be stagnant, that they were going to uh, evolve. So I, I, it's really, it's really, and, and I I admit I'm a little prejudiced because I was, you know, I lived through that era and I remember it, but it's really hard to get past 64. I mean, I, I did, I looked at the other years. I looked at the, you know, the musical progressions each year and, and, you know, some of the, you know, the, the music of the different years and I still couldn't get past 64. It really, it, it was just, there was just too much there to, to try and justify saying there was any other big year. 64 had to do it as far as I was concerned. Okay. Well, this is why I said a few moments ago, you can make a case in point for every year Mm -hmm. for various reasons. You know, I'm sure that if you lived in England, 1963 was the year. I mean, mm-hmm. for what 1964 was to us in America, that's what it was in England. That was their <clears> breakout <throat> year. They were everywhere in 1963. They dominated right. the charts in England that year. They were all over BBC Radio, left and right. I mean, if you were mm-hmm. a Beatle fan in 1963 in England, imagine how exciting that must have been. <laughs> so it right. depends also where, where you were living, too. And, uh, hey, there's no argument there that you're going to get it from me about 1964. It was so incredible if you lived in America and the rest of the world, too. I mean, the Beatles saturated radio in 1964. And to dominate the singles charts the way they did, I mean, and then you've got the Ed Sullivan shows and you've got uh, the first American tour and you've got a hard day's night in theaters. So many things happened in 1964. You can very easily say that was their best year to a lot of people. How mm-hmm. about you, Al? Well, actually, I'm uh, I'm on the same wavelength as uh, as Steve on that. I think uh, actually, I originally I was going to ask if we could uh, uh, if I could put sixty three and sixty four together as an entry, but I said nah, mm-hmm. nah, probably not. But I uh, I would have to go with sixty four because when you think about it, all that they accomplished in nineteen sixty four on New Year's Day, 1964, they had had this huge year in England, you know, with, uh, with four number one, number one singles, two number one albums, number one EPs, the, you know, the, the explosion of Beatlemania in England, and then that extended to Sweden in October. But really at that point, it was still fairly geographically concentrated. Yes, the the dynamite was uh, you know was just about to explode here, and so the fuse was going down and had been going down you know during December, but on December, on January first, nineteen sixty four, the great majority of Americans, including me, had never heard of the Beatles. And and even uh, and they had you know they had a uh, an engagement in France uh, scheduled, but the French kind of took a, you know kind of like a show me attitude toward them. They didn't immediately embrace them, so they still had some work to do as far as uh, as becoming the you know the the biggest group in the world which of course they would be by the end of by the end of 64 and so mm-hmm. you know it happened especially here it happened very quickly but and very big but it um uh it still it you know it uh, they had a a, a lot of uh, a lot of territory literally and figuratively to uh, to uh, take in uh through the year uh, but they were able to do it because especially right after the, you know, the now legendary first American visit, they, uh, they went back to England, went literally right back to work, recorded their first album of all original material, no covers. And, and then the movie that would 
really break down the you know the barriers of of uh, of rock movies you know of the the attitude of rock movies being you know just a bunch of songs and the flimsiest of uh plots and nothing very imaginative and it became uh, as uh, i believe it was andrew saris called it the citizen kane of jukebox musicals uh and then on the heels of that then they, they they toured uh in the far east and then came here for their for a month long tour which was a you know a very long tour at, at that time and they never did tour to that extent uh again but still that you know that month long tour between mid august and mid september of 64 cemented their massive popularity here they went back to England, went on, you know, went on tour again in their home country. Actually, their first full tour in their home country in a year, and mm-hmm. at the same time recorded their fourth album, which was admittedly kind of a not quite as much of an advance as uh, as a Hard Day's Night and with the Beatles had been, and certainly not the kind of advances that would be coming up over the next, over the next year. But, uh, it was, uh, it was, just, it was a, an absolute whirlwind. Uh, you know, as Steve said, they were, you know, they were everywhere, but also they, they earned it by, uh, by literally touring the world over the course of, of that year. And, um, uh, it was uh, it was just an amazing an amazing experience. Plus the fact that you know Steve mentioned how many top forty uh, singles they had. They had six number one singles in that one year, which is just mm-hmm. a ridiculous number. So right. it was you know just in tour in terms of dominance. Uh, Nineteen sixty four has got to be their uh, uh, their best year. I was I was gonna say um, I wasn't alive when uh, when the Beatles came to America, and I've always been fascinated looking back, and it's almost beyond comprehension the mm-hmm. speed with which it all happened, which Al alluded yeah. to. Mm-hmm. Uh, I want to hold your hand is released on December twenty sixth of nineteen sixty three, and within two weeks, three weeks tops, it's a number one. And within weeks from that, this thing exploded to the point where they get off an airplane and thousands of girls are waiting for them. And this was just a month and a half earlier, 95 to 99 percent of this country had never heard of them. Mm -hmm. Yep, That's mind boggling to me, uh, to being that I didn't get the opportunity to experience that. Uh, plus the fact that in a country of at that point 194 million people, 73 million tuned in to see their live American debut on the Ed Sullivan Show, and mm. and Darren's right that six weeks earlier, the vast majority of Americans had never heard of them, mm-hmm. and yet that night 73 million people tuned in, and that is still one of the highest rated programs highest rated episodes of a of a an ongoing series in the history of television mhm yeah yeah and as i pointed out a number of times here on this show and it's always worth bringing up again is the fact that that first half of 1964 we were listening to not only the music that the beatles were putting out at that moment but catching mm-hmm. up with what they did before that So we had so much new music to be exposed to all at once, and we were getting hits not just from Meet the Beatles or With the Beatles, but stuff from the Please Please Me album. You had Please Please Me as a hit, and Do You Want to Know What Secret was a hit, you know, and uh, Twist and Shout was a hit, plus all the newer stuff, too, as it was happening. So, you know, it was really exciting, And, and here in America, they released singles that weren't singles in the U.K., so there was a flood of so many hits and to have nonstop airplay like that was just extraordinary. And I do remember it 
uh, not as clearly as, as you, Steve, and you, Al, but um, mm -hmm. uh, I do very much remember, you know, putting on my transistor radio and going from WABC to WMCA, and one station plays a Beatles song, and then you go down to the other station, and they're playing a Beatles song, and it was just an amazing experience back then that, that I've never been able to, the closest I've ever even come to that when it comes to hit making was what the Bee Gees were doing when Saturday Night Live came out, because they not only had their own hits, but they had hits for other people. And uh, that's the only time I could ever remember anything even close to that, really. But uh, it was an amazing time, no doubt about it, 1964. And uh, to, to actually see them in the theater, to watch A Hard Day's Night, to be exposed to them for the first time like that, where their, where their individual personalities are being brought out, how amazing was that? You know, okay. seeing all the Ed Sullivan performances, and then and then uh, their first tour in America, and then all the other right. stuff that you had just been talking about, Al. No doubt mm -hmm. about it. In addition to you were talking about, uh, about, you know, how much airplay they were getting. There was one thing that happened in Boston um, that I, I don't know if it happened. Excuse me, on the rest of the East Coast. I remember uh, WBZ in Boston, which still exists. Uh, for anybody listening in Boston, hello, was playing. Uh, getting imports from Britain and they were playing, you know, Beals for Sale and stuff before uh, songs from the import albums before they were getting released over here. So I, that I remember um, that was happening on the East Coast too. I don't know if that was a, just a Boston phenomenon. No, no, no. It was, was that uh, happening? Was, was it that was, happening? it was everywhere because what would happen is, is at least in New York, uh, depending on which station, which it was, whether it was WMCA or WABC, would get the you know would get an imported copy of the album and then put it on the air and play it for you know a day or so until um, un un until Nat Weiss, the Beatles' American uh, attorney, um, <laughs> had uh, had the time to send out a, de a cease and desist order. Mm. So I remember being very disappointed. Uh, when I got Beatles 65 and, for instance, Kansas City, which I had heard on the radio and, and had also seen them perform on Shindig in, in October, wasn't on the album. I was, you we, know, and uh, it, it was, uh, you know, and there were a couple of, uh, there were a couple of other songs as well mm -hmm. that I recall hearing mm -hmm. on the radio uh, that, we uh, that we wouldn't get until June of 65 right. on Beatles 6. I was going to ask a question to Al and Steve. Back in those days, you heard a radio station had the new Beatle record from England. It's Beatles for Sale. How it was it possible to get a way to get these records, a consumer, get an import like it is today? Or was it virtually impossible? You'd have to do a special order. You know, unless you went into like in New York, there were stores that carried uh, that carried imports, uh, you know, but usually uh, for the most part imported classical records. Mm -hmm. uh, but I but, you know, you would probably have to do a special order for that it wasn't until probably 72, 73 when uh, Gem began importing. Right. Uh, large quantities of of rock records from England, that you, it was it was much easier to get imports. Otherwise, it was uh, yeah, it was generally like a special order type of thing. I was going to say, from my point of view, I I never, I only heard them on the radio. I never saw them, at least that I can remember now, uh, especially in the Boston area. I was going to say, say that one thing we should do sometime is talk about all our radio experiences because I think between all of us, we've had some interesting... I was fortunate mm -hmm. enough to have lived in Boston in 64, in New York in 66, and San Francisco in 68. Mm. So... <laughs> mm -hmm. So, yeah. So I, I, you know, so I've kind of been, you know, all over the place as far as that goes, but yeah, I mean, there were some, there were some great, uh, you know, the the ra radio played such a great role with the Beatles, and especially, and uh, yeah, that uh, I have some great memories of those, of those days. Um, mm -hmm. Wow, very much so. Yeah, but anyway, here we go. All right, so for me to pick my yeah, year, yeah, yeah, you, um, yeah, that time. <laughs> 
I'm going to go with 1967. And there's no doubt about it. You know, I could certainly go with 1964 because it was such an exciting time. One thing about 64 through 66, you do have the advantage of the touring here in America. So you not Mm -hmm. only have the experience of the records coming out during that year, but if you were fortunate enough to see the Beatles in concert, you have that to add to it. But in 1967, I mean, just for the simple fact that the Sgt. Pepper album came out, which became, you know, by so many people's standards, the greatest album of all time, and uh, in most polls is rated as such, maybe not as often today, but, uh, I mean, 1967 was an extraordinary year for that album, which kind of changed everything, as well as a lot of other important albums of that year. But if all they did was put out Sgt. Pepper, I think you can make a case that 67 was their best year. But once you add all the stuff from the Magical Mystery Tour EP and then the singles from 67 that made the Magical Mystery Tour album. I mean, nowadays it's very common for Beatle fans to say and to think, and this could be a show to itself, that the best single the Beatles ever put out was Penny Lane and Strawberry Fields Forever. So, you know, you have that single, you have All You Need Is Love in the summertime of of 67 with Babe, You're a Rich Man, and you also have the Our World broadcast. And then you also have Hello, Goodbye, and and I Am the Walrus at the end of the year as a single. So you've got three number one singles in 1967. True, not six number ones like 1964, but it was still a great year. And then you've got the Sgt. Pepper album and such amazing music between Sgt. Pepper and Magical Mystery Tour and those singles. I mean, Strawberry Fields Forever is such an incredible song, an incredible recording that is so much appreciated, thankfully, now more so than it ever has been. But uh, between that and Penny Lane, I mean, back to back, that's that's an amazing single, a truly amazing single. And then you add that to Sgt. Pepper and all the other stuff on Magical Mystery Tour. It's kind of hard to top that musically. And um, if you're talking about a musical peak, which is another show (laughs) we could do, (laughs) I think probably 67, you can make the case for 66 or 67. The only Mm -hmm. uh, difference being that in 66... The Beatles only put out one album. So, um, you know, in 67, they put out two, two great albums, albeit Magical Mystery Tour was not intended to be an album, but still two albums worth of incredible material. And so when you think about all the amazing tracks on both those albums, it's really hard to top as far as I'm concerned. You know, so, 1967 was a year uh, that the Beatles kind of controlled their fate. Uh, They were the ones calling the shots, making the music, releasing the songs, releasing the albums. 1964's impact in this country was pretty much not in their control. Uh, It was the dam bursting, Capitol Records holding back, and then giving in, and then it exploded. And that wasn't in the Beatles' control. Uh, they making their music and performing the concerts was in their control, but the impact that they had was out of their control. Whereas in 67, they were the trendsetters. They were behind the controls. They were steering the ship. It was, mm. it was all their thing uh, in 67. So there's a different way of looking at the two years. Impact-wise, I'm actually a little swayed by Stephen L's argument for 66 for 64 rather and and maybe i have one thing working against me i wasn't alive so i did you know i'm hearing the stories in hindsight and thinking wow that must have been something else but you know 64 was a good part of it out of the beatles control where 67 you know they were the ones it was done the way they wanted it it was happened because they wanted it to happen and certainly the release of Sgt. Pepper. And, you know, the first time one heard it either on the radio or after getting the album itself and putting it on, it was, it was an event. It was one of those kind of shared experiences where you, where you knew that that particular weekend, that first weekend in June, that Beatle fans all over the world were going through this same experience of hearing this this incredible album uh plus the you know, plus the fact that it had been 10 months since they had released revolver and 
mm. 10 months between albums at that time was an eternity. <laughs> I, I mean, the, the, the wait for Sgt. Pepper was torturous, absolutely torturous. And so that, that's what made its release all the more special. Plus the fact that it was this revolutionary album that changed the course, really, of the, the music industry from an industry based on the single to one where the album became the, the pivot point. Mm-hmm. All of us have said some really great opinions here as far as what the, the, the Beatles' best year is, although uh, 64, I might be going with Darren now <laughs> and shifting over. But 67, <laughs> yeah, it's... 67 though, it's, it, that, that, that year just, you know, it's, it's mind-blowing what the Beatles put out in 67. But you could say that about all the years as far as I'm concerned. Mm-hmm. Sure. But it's interesting then that we basically split right down the middle between two years, because Darren, I mm-hmm. think you you did you did finally settle on sixty seven, right? I, yeah, I think because sixty seven had a little more of a commercial punch to it, the commercial yeah. success, chart success, sales. Sixty six to me though, if you're talking about in my mind internally for the band, sixty six was an important year because yes. it changed. It started to change. You know, and the game really started to change, you know, in mid-66. Everything was very, very I- interesting with the Beatles. Well, they, of course, they it was it, they didn't control this, but it was like right in the exact midpoint. They stopped right. touring, and it changed. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. about everything that came next, as we now look back, can be brought to that moment when they stopped being a touring band and started becoming studio rats who had extra time on their hands. And the four mm-hmm. of them just completely blossomed as individuals. And, uh, you know, it just, it's amazing. But to me, 66 was that, that year that it, that it transitioned. Yeah. yeah. I bet there are a lot of people who would say, I wish we could combine 66 and 67 and then, you know, there right. wouldn't even be a contest for some people. You know, if, if Revolver and Sgt. Pepper came out in 66, there'd be no contest. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, but uh, Sgt. Pepper and Magical Mystery Tour was a pretty damn good year. <laughs> yes. The other thing with 66, one more thing in, in closing with 66 is it, you throw a couple of weeks out. Revolver, you know, if you got it for Christmas... In 65, it kind of had impact in your life in early 66. As mature and important of, uh, of an album as Revol- uh, Rubber Soul, I meant Rubber Soul when I said uh, late 65. Your, your 1966 started with Rubber Soul on your turntable. The, 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 the musical growth from Rubber Soul to Revolver, if you thought that mm. the maturation process was amazing before that, Rubber Soul to Revolver was off the charts. Mm-hmm. Yep, and I still would love to be uh, like a fly on the wall, go back in time in my time machine, you know, and sit in with a young Steve Marinucci or a young Al Sussman, and watch them put Revolver on their record players for the first time, and see oh, the yeah. look on their face, mm-hmm. you know, when they when they heard that, you know, you know, in their uh, with their long flowing psychedelic robes in '67, the first time <laughs> they threw. Sergeant Pepper on their record player and like holy smoke, yeah, you know, yeah, that's that that I I mean I still can remember what it was like listening to the album for the first time, and I and I don't really have that memory with every Beatles album. I mean I can remember hearing them on the radio first, but I don't remember what it was like sitting down and listening to the album for the first time. But Sergeant Pepper, that I do. That I do remember. Mm. Uh, and it was a cultural thing, too, I imagine, Al. And, and Steve, you put the record on, you got blown away by it, and you you went out, and you'd get your, you'd bump into your friends, and you probably were talking about it. Did you hear that? Mm-hmm. Did yep. you get your copy yet? Did you listen to it? I mean, you know, and it probably was a big topic of conversation as well amongst friends, amongst uh, you know, people that were of, did you hear that? 
mm-hmm. you know, calling your friend up after the first play. You've got to get this record if you didn't get it yet, you know, kind of thing. Absolutely. All right. Well, we are about out of time here, and this has been a blast. Two uh, interesting conversations, one about the Grammys and the other about the Beatles' best year. If you would like to get in touch with us here at the show, we have an email address, which is things we said today radio show at gmail.com. We also do have a Facebook page for things we said today. And if you would like to get in touch with me directly, Ken Michaels, my email address is everylittlething at att.net. And if you can, please check out my own website, which is kenmichaelsradio.com. There's Beatles trivia, special contests, interviews, all kinds of things for Beatle fans on the website. Again, kenmichaelsradio.com. Steve, if people want to get in touch with you, what must they do? Write to uh, beatlesexaminer at gmail.com. Please subscribe to my Beatles Examiner page on examiner.com. And I'm all over Facebook. Uh, I have a, my, under my name, I have a Beatles Examiner page, and I have a, a news group uh, for Beatle News called Beatle News and Commentary. Okay. How about you, Al? Uh, the easiest way is through my Facebook page. Just uh, you know, do a search for Al Sussman uh, or uh, on Twitter at uh, at a sus 49 a s u s s 49 uh also at uh www.beetlefan.com and as a matter of fact um i just did a blog post for beetle fans um uh blog page uh which is called something new uh and uh, it's on the it's on the very subject that we talked about for uh the first half of uh of this show uh the whole mm. Kanye, Rihanna, Lady Gaga, McCartney collaboration controversy. Uh, and I, um, I believe that will be up uh, in the next day or so. Although by, okay. by, the, time, by the time this airs, it'll, it'll be up on the something, the something New page. And Darren, how about you? Steve forgot to mention also you can reach him at uh, his Lady Gaga fan page on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> Go there. And, uh, anyway, <laughs> uh, you could uh, my my I have actually actually have two Facebook pages. But uh, it's best to probably go to Darren DeVivo on WFUV radio to type the whole name in and uh, like that uh, or contact me at my WFUV email address, which is my name, Darren DeVivo, at WFUV.org, or simply either, if you're in the New York City area, tune into 90.7 FM, or if you're listening right now uh, somewhere in Tibet, you could listen at WFUV.org worldwide. I'm on weeknights at 6, uh, and uh, it's Eastern Time, and also on our FUV music channel, that's the HD2 thingy we have. I'm on weekends, uh, 6 a.m. and again at 6 p.m. Saturday and Sundays at 90.7 FM HD2. Oy, this is hard to remember. And WFUV.org. <laughs> All right. This has been a blast. Darren, thanks again for joining us. We'll have you on again pretty soon, I'm sure. Terrific. Terrific. And for things we said today, I'm Ken Michaels being joined by Steve Marinucci, Al Sussman, and Darren DeVivo, thanking you so much for joining us, and we'll see you all next time. Mm-hmm.